Hi, welcome to the Physics 2 Tutor. First, let me stop and say that I'm incredibly excited to teach this course because it's been a few years since I've released the Physics 1 Tutor. Uh, the Physics 1 Tutor dealt with all of your Newtonian mechanics, your uh, basically your velocity, acceleration, trajectories, energy, rotational motion, and all those Newtonian concepts, okay? And in this course is going to be the middle course in the sequence that's going to cover all of the things associated with heat transfer, uh, also known as thermodynamics, which is a big, fancy, complicated name that we'll demystify here in, for you in a minute. It's called thermodynamics and all of your uh, equations related to that stuff. We're also going to get the second half of this course is going to deal with your wave motion, the structure of a wave, the equations of waves, sound waves, Doppler shifts, and all those things associated with waves. That's the middle course. That's this course here. And then subsequent to this, we're going to do physics three, which is going to all be about electricity and magnetism and optics and all of those things dealing with light, okay? So that's what we're going to do in this course. So I'm very excited to teach it. The first thing I want to tell you is that even though this is called Physics 2, okay, we have Physics 1, Physics 2, Physics 3, usually that's the sequence. Even though this is Physics 2, it doesn't mean it's any harder than anything you learned before, okay? In fact, that's, that's true of every course here. And When it's called uh, Calculus 1, Calculus 2, Calculus 3, or Physics 1, 2, and 3, it doesn't mean it's any harder. It just means it's different material, okay? There's too much material to fit in one class. So you split it up and you go from there. And this class is sort of a standalone thing. You really don't, I mean, I won't lie to you here, it's very useful to have taken Physics 1. There, there are some things in Physics 1 that will help you in this class. But by and large, everything you're going to study in this class is really going to be almost standalone uh, from everything else. It's very important stuff, but it's sort of standalone material, okay? The first thing we're going to broach in this uh, course is going to be the topic of thermodynamics. Now, first let me ask you a question. What does thermodynamics mean? Okay, Think about the word. Thermo, what does that mean? Thermos, uh, thermal, th uh, thermodynamics, the first part of it, thermo, means thermal. So it's going to be dealing with heat. It's going to be dealing with temperature. Now the good news is, you all have a lifetime of experience dealing with thermal stuff, okay? You've, you've gotten ice out of the freezer, you've boiled water on the stove, so you've got a lot of experience intuition-wise with what it should all basically be about, okay? Whereas you get into some really advanced physics, you'll have no idea really other than reading a book what they're really talking about because maybe you've never seen a photon of light or you've, maybe you've never seen you know, uh, an atom with your own eyes, okay? Well here with the thermodynamics, even though it's a big name, even though we're going to deal with some things you haven't heard of before, fundamentally you've all dealt with temperature. You've all dealt with heat transfer. Uh, and so you have a lot of experience with it. So draw upon that because you're going to need that when you solve your problems, okay? The first section here, the title of this section is called Thermometers and Temperature Scales. So fundamentally this section is going to be uh, pretty obvious to you at first that we're going to be talking about thermometers and in general what is a thermometer, how do you build a thermometer, and how do you define a temperature scale. Uh, you've all dealt with Fahrenheit here in the United States. We, we deal with Fahrenheit uh, as a temperature scale. We'll talk about that. More universally around the world and also in engineering, even here in the U.S., you don't deal in Fahrenheit ever, okay? You always deal in Celsius, which is the temperature scale we're going to talk about here in just a second. And you always deal, and especially when you get into more advanced physics, with the Kelvin temperature scale, which is a really cool scale that we'll talk about here in just a second. So there's three main temperature scales. We'll talk about them all in a minute. But before we actually get to the temperature scales, we need to define something that, uh, this is one of those great examples when you look in your book, you read it, and you just think it's going to be so incredibly complicated because of the title of it, but when you actually break it down, it's really not hard at all. And the title of it is, is a little definition, a little uh, a law here that we need to learn. It's called the zeroth law of thermodynamics. What we're going to find here in the subsequent sections is there's going to be a first law of thermo and a second law of thermodynamics. This one is sort of the very most basic building block law. It's called the zeroth law of thermodynamics, and, uh, and it's very important to understand. So I'm going to write it on the board, just read it with me as we write it, and then we'll talk about it. It's going to be very simple, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to write that down. This is called the zeroth law of thermo dynamics. Okay, and I'm very, uh, very seldom going to write this entire word thermodynamics out uh, all the time. I'm just doing it here 
because it's our first section, but I'll, I'll abbreviate it as thermo or something as we go along. So try to understand it as we write it on the board, and if you don't, we'll, we'll make it straight here in a second. Okay, if bodies, bodies can be anything, a Coke can, an ice chest, a car, anything with, you know, with mass and volume, if bodies A and B, so we have two bodies A and B, are separately in thermal equilibrium. We'll explain what all this stuff is in a second. With a third body, and that third body is, is just going to be labeled C, then A and B are in thermal equilibrium. Here I go with the definitions. This is how I'm going to write equilibrium, so I don't write that out every time. Thermal equilibrium with each other. In physics, you're always going to be dealing with bodies A and B. A body here, a body here. Everything's written in terms of the real world, so that's what, was, what we're doing here. Okay, what it's saying is, let's just read it. If bodies A and B, I have two things here, two separate things, are in a separately in thermal equilibrium with a third body C. Now, what does thermal equilibrium mean? Okay, there's a lot of terms in physics. Thermal means what you might think, heat. Okay, something related to heat, something related to temperature. We'll get more rigorous as we go. Okay, equilibrium means the word equilibrium means no changes. Nothing is changing any longer. Okay, if I uh, you know have a mouse trap. Okay, and I've got the thing sprung back with the cheese there. Okay, and then I trip that cheese, that mousetrap is going to start to flip over. Well, as it's moving, it's, it's definitely not in equilibrium. I mean, it's moving, moving, moving. Eventually, it's going to snap and hit the board. The mousetrap's going to flip around. Eventually, it's going to come to rest. After that point, it's in equilibrium. Nothing's changing any longer. That's all equilibrium means. When something is in thermal equilibrium with another body, it just means that there's no more heat transfer between them. You might have a hot body and a cold body, and you stick them together. Yeah, some of this heat is going to move over here and warm up the colder body, but after a long time, that's going to be done. It's just like taking an ice cube out of a tray. It's going to melt. It's going to reach room temperature. After that point, it's in equilibrium. So we have bodies A and B are in thermal equilibrium with a third body here. Then these two bodies that we initially had are in thermal equilibrium with each other if we place uh, them in thermal contact. So what does that, that mean in terms of, of a picture? Uh, pictures are very important in physics, and so we're going to do that here. So here we have a, a, um, a body, and we're going to call that body A. Okay, And that guy that we said here is in thermal equilibrium with another body C because originally it says if bodies A and B are in thermal equilibrium with a third body C. What this means is that uh, these guys are in thermal equilibrium. I have a block here and a block here and I stick them together with some kind of you know peanut butter or some kind of some kind of substance that really makes them conduct heat between the boundary here very easily so that the if this has a, a higher temperature than this or if this has a higher temperature than this the heat can be transferred back and forth. I mean you all know heat transfer sounds like a complicated thing. You all know about heat transfer. I mean it's the same thing that happens when you you know you take something hot out of the microwave and it's very hot. Well it sits in the in the room and it distributes its heat back into the room. It's transferring its heat back into the room. That's heat transfer. That's all that is. So if we put two things together and we let them sit a long time, eventually they will be at the same uh, uh, temperature. So these guys we say are in thermal equilibrium, which means, let me make a B here, okay, this means no heat is transferred. Okay, it means when you first stick them together, yes, they might be at different temperatures. They might then transfer heat between them, but after a long time, that's not happening any longer, okay? That's all it means. So, that's one of these bodies. Now, what if we had this body C? Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make C the same exact color as what I had here. So, if I have C like this, Okay, same exact body. 
Uh, and later in the day, I bring that guy into thermal equilibrium with this guy here, which is body B. Same exact thing. We say these things are in thermal equilibrium, which means that they are, uh, there's no heat transfer. Okay, so let's read the theorem here, or the law here. If bodies A and B are separately in thermal equilibrium with a third body C, here's the third body C. We put them, we wedge them together separately to body A and B, and they're all in thermal equilibrium with the same body C. Then A and B are in thermal equilibrium with each other. Okay? So what that would mean, if I were to draw it then, if I'm going to use the right colors, is that would mean that body A, which is this blue one here, is also in thermal equilibrium with body B. Okay? with body B. That's all it means. And these guys are in thermal equilibrium. Okay. So before, you know, we get into talking about this theorem more, let's apply this to the real world, okay? If I had this pen right here, and I said, this pen is at 10 degrees, let's say, okay? And let's say this sheet of paper is at 10 degrees, let's say. How do I know that they're at 10 degrees? Because I have a thermometer, right? That I measure the temperature here and then measure here, the temperature here. The block C is basically defining a thermometer. That's basically what this is about. That's the title of the section is thermometers and temperature scales. It turns out that thermometers use the zero law of thermodynamics to define what a thermometer is. And we take it for granted. It, it seems so obvious. Why would you even write this on the board? Well, it's, it's like in the beginning of mathematics. You, you define one plus one as two, very simple stuff and you move on from there and you get into the more complicated material. Same thing here. All this is saying is that if I take this guy and I prove it's at the same temperature as this other thing over here, this other block C or this thermometer, okay, I remove him and I put him and I verify he's at the exact same temperature as that thermometer over there, then because they're both in thermal equilibrium, which means the same temperature as this third body over here, since I proved that they're both in thermal equilibrium with a third body, C, then I have proven their thermal equilibrium with each other. If A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C. That's all it is, okay? It's not a very complicated thing. But when you write it down and you have thermal equilibrium and, and everything else, it sounds complicated, but all it's defining is basically the concept of a thermometer, that you can design a device that you could then measure the temperatures of all things around the room, and if you see that they're all the same, then you've proven that there would be in thermal equilibrium with each other should you move them together. If I take A with B and put them together, it's just proving that they're at the same temperature, that there's got not going to be any heat transfer between them because I've already proven that they're effectively at the same temperature as a third body. Okay? That's really all it says. That's, that's what the zeroth law of, of thermodynamics is really saying, is that you can invent something called a thermometer. Okay? So what we're going to do next is we're going to take this uh, concept and we're going to go a little bit farther with it. And we're going to talk about the concept of temperature. Now we've talked about the, that there's Fahrenheit, we've talked about that there's Celsius, and we've talked about that there, there is a, uh, a temperature scale called Kelvin. Now we're going to go a little bit deeper into those and define them and really show you how they're defined and so that you can solve some problems with them. Okay. So, the next little subsection here is temperature scales. Temp is going to be temperature all throughout this course. I'm going to abbreviate it. Uh, scales. Okay? So what we're going to do, we're going to define the concept of temperature. Let me ask you this. What do you think temperature is when you really sit down and think about it? Well, you know, if you take a thermometer and you put it in your mouth, you're going to read you know, if it's a digital thermometer, you'll just read the numbers. But if it's a mercury or an alcohol thermometer, you'll see the, the, the red or the kind of the silver color kind of get bigger or smaller, and you'll read the number off the, off the uh, side there. But what is temperature fundamentally? Well, you know that when something is hotter, okay, the temperature is greater. And you know when something's very cold, the temperature is very low. Intuitively, you know that temperature has something to do with energy, okay? It has something to do with energy, but not the energy of a baseball, like in Physics 1, that I would throw. It's not really the same thing. This is really more along the lines of dealing with the internal energy or sort of the energy of the atoms in the substance you have. If I take a block of aluminum at room temperature, it's going to have a certain temperature. If I put a flame under it and heat it up, what's going to happen to the atoms and the molecules in that aluminum, they're going to start vibrating because they're going to be given energy by the heat, by the flame. And so they're going to start vibrating. Eventually, if you heat it up enough, it'll 
it'll just they'll just be vibrating like crazy. So when you put a thermometer in contact with something, what you're doing is you're measuring how much energy is inside of that substance. So when you have a fever, okay, and you're sick, you your atoms are actually vibrating more, and 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 your body is using using the resources it has to increase your body temperature to actually fight off the illness that you have. Same as the aluminum, whenever you put a, put a flame under it, it's hotter because it has more energy. So temperature is fundamentally a measure of the energy inside of a substance. It's not really measured in joules because, just like in physics one, because it's an aggregate average of all of the millions and millions and millions of molecules in there. It's an average value, so to speak. So we define these other scales. So what we've already said here in words, that temperature measures the amount of kinetic energy uh, that a substance has at a molecular level. Okay? So we've already said this. Temperature measures the amount of kinetic energy that a substance has at a molecular level and it's an aggregate it's an average of all of the millions and millions and billions of atoms in every little substance you have so just to kind of drive it home you already know this but if you have a higher temperature that's what the arrow means a higher temperature it means that the atoms are moving faster in the substance okay or if it's a solid they may be vibrating faster and more violently if it's a gas they may be shooting off before they hit another uh, uh, atom with a hi higher velocity. If the temperature is lower, well then it, it stands to reason that the atoms are moving slower. No big surprise there. Okay, the atoms are uh, moving slower. So how do you actually measure this temperature? I mean, you already know the answer because you've dealt with thermometers all your life, but how, fundamentally, how do you do it? Well, what you do is some things are hot and some things are cold. How do you quantify it? What you do is you design a device, okay, that can somehow tap into and measure the thermal energy inside of these devices and somehow give you a readout to tell you that. Now, you know that you've been able to uh, to, to look at these uh, thermometers with a digital readout and, and that's sort of cheating a little bit because the computer in there is doing all the math but if you were to really sit down in your in your garage or something and actually build a thermometer how would you do it? There's a couple of ways you can do it. There are actually you don't see this too much out there in, in, uh, in, in, in your medicine cabinet, but you can build a thermometer out of a coil of wire, actually. Certain wires, if you coil them up, like little strips of metal, uh, they'll be kind of rigid, and if you heat them up, the metal will expand and that little coil will unroll, okay? And you can actually measure that unrolling. That will be directly proportional to the temperature. Think about it. If, if you have a coil, a very tight coil of ribbon of metal, and if you heat it up, if it expands, it's going to unroll. You can actually do that. And sometimes that's actually what's used inside of your air conditioner to measure the temperature in your house to kick it on or off. Okay. Now, it's much more common uh, for all of us to be aware of how we deal with temperature and thermometers in terms of uh, what we see in our medicine cabinet. The most common way that you would actually measure temperature and actually build a device would be to look at the change, the, phys the physical change of a property of a substance. Okay, Usually it's the volume change of a, a little bit of mercury or a little bit of alcohol inside of a, of a sealed tube and that's what's going on here. You heat it up a little bit and the volume is going to expand because you're giving energy to it so it's going to start vibrating, it's going to expand the alcohol which is red. Sometimes you see the red thermometers and if it's mercury it's the same kind of thing. It's just some piece of mercury, a liquid mercury in there and it expands, it gets bigger whenever you give it uh, energy from whatever you're doing, putting it in your mouth or whatever. So that's basically what you do and if you wanted to draw a picture of that it would be a real simple thing to do. Basically what you're going to have is kind of a tube like this and a little bulb down here okay so what would be down here would be mercury as an example which is a liquid metal at room temperature and what you would do is if you put some heat into that maybe initially the mercury level is here that maybe at room temperature now if you actually add heat Okay, the mercury level may rise up to here. And 
that makes sense because you give energy to it and so it gives energy and all the little molecules and atoms inside of this mercury is going to vibrate and hit each other and it's going to start to raise the column there. And if you actually were to cool it down, maybe you put it in the freezer let's say, then maybe the mercury level actually even comes down here. So you subtract heat. Okay, and then of course it contracts because of the exact opposite thing. You're taking heat away. These things are not banging into each other so often, so they just sort of shrink on themselves. By the way, a little aside, you can add heat to something and you can take heat away from something. You never add cold to something. That just never happens. You don't add cold to anything. Cold is just the opposite of heat. Uh, that's the absence of heat. So I can add heat to something, take heat away from something. You never really add cold to something. When you put it in your freezer, you're not adding cold. You're just taking away the heat from the object that you put in there. So what we've talked about up until this point is conceptually how to build a thermometer. Now let's go into a little more detail and let's pretend that in your garage you actually constructed a glass tube. You put some mercury in there and you want to try to calibrate it to uh, something that makes sense in everyday life. I mean, you, you want to measure things around you and make it useful to you so that you can then use it in your everyday experiences, but you need to calibrate it somehow, otherwise you'll never know exactly what temperature you're reading. So how do you do that? Well, the most convenient way to calibrate a thermometer is based on the most common liquid you have available to you. It would be the easiest, most commonly, universally understood thing that you could calibrate it to, and that would be water. When you think about it, everybody has experience with water. Water freezes in the winter and water melts and eventually if you put enough heat into it, it goes into steam. So everyone has used water. So that's why the basis of the temperature scales and thermometers and everything else is always based on water. Okay. So what you do is uh, the way you want to do this to calibrate in Celsius, which as I said a minute ago is really the most common temperature scale, even though we use Fahrenheit here, here in the U.S. Celsius is a much, much, much better temperature scale, and you'll see why in a second. Basically what you do uh, to calibrate it is you, you put thermometer in a bucket of water, of ice water, okay? So what you have here is you have a little bucket, right, just like this, and inside this bucket, you know, you have ice. So you actually have a lot of ice. You make it almost like a slushy. Okay? And what you do is you take and you take your thermometer that you just built and you stick it right in the bottom here. And so you chill this thing down uh, there. So what you're talking about here, this, this ice water down here is what's called the ice point. And it's exactly what you would expect. Basically what you do is you take the water and you put so much ice into it that the actual liquid water that's in contact with the with the thermometer is right at the freezing point. It's just about to freeze but it hasn't frozen yet. Likewise the ice that is warming up because you put it in the water just about to melt but it hasn't quite melted yet. That's called the ice point. It basically takes the uh, water there and it puts it exactly at the freezing point of, of ice, but it just hasn't frozen yet. So that's a very important temperature because, like I said, it's around us every day, all over the place. So what we will then do is, uh, if we had our thermometer here that we built, all right, let's say that we put it in here and the temperature or the volume there measured right here then I would say, okay, this is zero degrees Celsius. I'm going to mark that and say the freezing point of water it gives me this much volume uh, expansion or contraction of the mercury that's in there, and I'm going to mark it off, scribe it, and I'm going to say, okay, from here on out, that is zero degrees Celsius. That's the freezing point of water, and that's, that's exactly how it's defined. It's defined in terms of the freezing point of water. Now, what if I want to define the upper, an upper uh, temperature here? Well, the most common way to do that and the, the way that makes the most sense would be the, um, the boiling point of water because, like I said, water is, is universal. It's everywhere. Everyone has experience with water. So what you would do is you'd put this in here like this, and you would have some water in here, obviously, and you would put a flame under it just like this, right, and you would heat it up, and so eventually this water would start to produce steam. 
So right at the point that the water begins to boil, you know when you, you make your macaroni and cheese at home and you boil it, right at the point at which it just starts to boil, you can see the steam coming off the top and you can see the bubbles just start to form in the bottom. That is called the, uh, the steam point, the, the steam point of water there because uh, water and steam, steam can coexist. So basically you heat the thing up and uh, you get a, 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 basically you start to boil this water at the exact moment at which it starts to boil. You mark that off on your thermometer. Let's say at that point the, temp the level of the mercury inside rose to let's say here. So at that point I would mark that and I would call that 100 degrees Celsius. So you've just designed your first temperature scale uh, and that's the Celsius temperature scale. And so that's exactly how they did it in the old days. They knew they wanted to measure temperature around us. They knew they had to calibrate it. The way they did that is they calibrated against a known substance that always freezes at the same temperature and always boils at the same temperature. They marked two scribes on the thing and said this is the 100 degrees Celsius, this is 0 degrees Celsius, the, and then we'll divide it into 100 even spacings between, and if anything goes above that and below that, we'll just continue the scale up and down. That is the birth and the genesis of our Celsius uh, scale. So that's exactly what, what, what you have there. And if you were to look at this, if you were to plot, just for giggles here, the temperature that you put uh, into this guy against the kinetic energy of the molecule of the water, okay, just for, just for giggles, then what you would see is it would be increasing. It would make sense to you. As you increase the temperature, the kinetic energy of the molecules goes up and up and up. And at this point, it's at zero degrees Celsius. And at this point, it's the boiling point at 100 degrees Celsius. So you start with zero degrees Celsius, you add temperature to it, or you actually are adding heat, that raises the energy level of the water in there, and so it increases the temperature, eventually you get to the boiling point, and guess what, ladies and gentlemen, if you give enough energy to water, you're gonna vibrate the molecules so much that they're just gonna leave the surface and they're gonna be gone forever because you've given them so much energy, and that's called boiling. You boil the thing because you give so much energy, the molecules can eventually just liberate themselves from the, from the pot. They just go off into the, into the, uh, to the air around you. That's exactly what boiling is. We're gonna talk a lot more about that a little bit later, just sort of a, uh, a preview here. So we have talked about the Celsius temperature scale, which has zero and 100 degrees as a sort of its anchor points, and uh, even spacing of degree marks in between, okay? Now we're gonna talk about the Kelvin temperature scale, okay? Uh, it's the same degree spacing as Celsius, but absolute zero is the reference. Let me ask you a question uh, and see if, see if this makes sense to you. If I'm looking at water here, and I start here, and this is room temperature, or this is boiling, and let's say I cool it down, ta I'm taking heat away, taking heat away, eventually I get to zero Celsius and I freeze the water, so it's ice cube. And let's say for some reason I have a really good freezer, and I keep on making it colder and colder and colder, so the energy, the, this is the kinetic energy of the molecules inside the water, the kinetic energy keeps going down, 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 down. Well, how low can you go? I mean, if I'm measuring the kinetic energy of the molecules, if I make it colder and colder, eventually these molecules, they're just going to stop. They're not going to move at all, okay? And that's called absolute zero. Absolute zero referenced in here. So the Kelvin scale is the same degree spacing as this, but the reference point is actually the point at which all atomic motion stops. And it's actually impossible to get all the way down to absolute zero. It's just too cold. But fundamentally and theoretically, that's exactly what it is. Everything in this room, everything you're touching, the floor, your shoes, everything, all the atoms are vibrating. They're always doing that because they have a certain energy, because they're at a certain temperature. If you cool them down, they're going to slow down their vibrations. That's what happens when you cool things down. That's why the temperature goes down. Eventually, they stop. If you theoretically could get all the way to the bottom and suck all their energy out, they wouldn't move at all. That would be called absolute zero. So what you have here is, if you could get to this point down here, then this point where all kinetic energy goes exactly to zero, this would be 
zero Kelvin. Zero Kelvin. That's exactly what that is. And everything above Kelvin goes just up with a, uh, you know, with a, a gradually increasing temperature just like everything else before, but it's uh, zero degrees Kelvin goes here. So let me ask you this. How big is this spacing here, right here? This point right here, zero degrees Celsius, corresponds to 273.15 Kelvin. Okay, so that's sort of a conversion factor there. The freezing point of water is zero Celsius because that was sort of the first temperature scale they invented. It also corresponds to 273.15 Kelvin. Of course, the Kelvin number is bigger than the Celsius number because the reference point of the Kelvin scale is, is absolute zero where nothing moves. So these two temperatures, the 273 and the zero, they represent exactly the same temperature. They represent the same energy. It's just that this is a different scale. When you when you see something as 200 or 300 Kelvin, you're looking at pretty much room temperature. Okay? When you see something as 4 Kelvin, you know that it is incredibly cold. Much colder than Antarctica, much colder than anything you've ever experienced in your whole life. Anything close to 0 Kelvin is basically something that only happens in space. Or liquid helium, or liquid hydrogen, or something incredibly cold like that. And that's the difference here. So the difference here between these two points, I've already spelled it out here, sort of a conversion factor. The distance between these two points here is 273.15. And that, that matters here in a second because absolute zero is the reference point because what we're going to do right over here in this board here is we're going to write a conversion factor to be able to convert between Celsius and Kelvin. So the temperature in Kelvin is just going to equal the temperature in Celsius plus 273.15. So if you have a temperature in Celsius and you add this number to it, you're going to get the temperature in Kelvin. And you can see that from looking here. If I have zero degrees Celsius, the freezing point of water, and I add 273.15 to it, then I'm going to get the Kelvin, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to get the, uh, yeah, the Kelvin equivalent. If I have 100 degrees Celsius and I add the 273.15 to it, I'm going to get the Kelvin equivalent. So basically, this is the way I internalize it. I always remember it like this. I start with Celsius and I add the 273 and I'm going to get my Kelvin. It makes sense because the Kelvin temperatures are always going to be greater than the Celsius temperatures. Because like I said, your reference point is totally different. Your zero point is totally much, much colder. And that's the reason why it's different. Now, some books prefer to write it a little differently. If you solve this little equation here for Celsius, then what you'll get, I think you'll see, is going to be uh, T Kelvin minus 273.15. Okay? So basically, you can use whatever one you want to use. It doesn't matter. It's exactly the same thing. Personally, I like to remember it according to the first one. It just makes more sense to me. The Kelvin number should always be bigger. That's what you really need to remember. So I just take my Celsius and I add the 273.15 to it. Okay? So that's what you're going to have to use for your homework. So remember that. Write that down. You're going to have to remember that for sure. And you're going to be using this quite a bit because a lot of times in the physics problems, they're going to give you your temperatures in Celsius or maybe even in Fahrenheit. And you're going to have to know with experience as we start to solve all these problems, you're going to have to know when you need to use Kelvin. And most of the time you're going to be using Kelvin in the physics equations. Not all the time, but most of the time. And you'll see that as we go forward. So you'll need to convert frequently. So it's, it's an easy conversion though. Just kind of write that down and remember it. What about the famous Fahrenheit scale? Okay. This scale is effectively useless in my opinion. Uh, the reason, and you'll see why, it's just sort of like, like all of the English units, and believe me, I, I live in America and I grew up with them, but I still think they're useless. It's because they don't have any real rhyme or reason to it, and you'll see in a second. The, um, the, 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 the anchor points of the Fahrenheit scale is the, is the freezing point of water and the boiling point of water, uh, but the temperature, the, 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 the spacing of the degree marks there in the Fahrenheit scale is different than the Celsius scale, and the anchor points are different also. So what you'll want to do here and I'll just kind of give it to you here. The temperature in Fahrenheit, the easiest way just to kind of keep going here is just to show you. The temperature in Fahrenheit is the fraction 9 fifths times the temperature in Celsius plus 32. So this is something you're going to have to remember because you're going to be having, you're going to have to convert back and forth between uh, Celsius and Fahrenheit and also uh, to Kelvin. So just to kind of prove it to yourself, the ice point, the ice point 
is zero degrees Celsius, right? So if I want to look at the, the temperature, the Fahrenheit temperature of that, then what I would do is I would use this guy here, 9 fifths times temperature in Celsius plus 32. But since I'm plugging in zero degrees Celsius, it's 9 fifths times zero plus 32. So that would mean the temperature in Fahrenheit would be 32 degrees. And that, for those of you who live in the U.S. or in, in the U.K. that use this, you know that the 32 degrees is freezing in the Fahrenheit scale. And the reason is just this formula gives it to you. You plug in your, your Celsius and this fraction, and, and basically what it's doing is it's looking at the two scales and converting between them for you. Now, if you wanted to find what the boiling point of water was, that's very simple to do, too. The steam point, the, the temperature, the Fahrenheit temperature is going to be 9 fifths. Now, in the Celsius scale, it's 100, because that's the boiling point uh, of water, the steam point is another way of saying that. That's going to be 100 uh, plus 32. And if you actually take this and do the multiplication times 9 fifths and add 32, you're going to get 212 Fahrenheit. Now, you see why I don't like the scale very much. Uh, the Fahrenheit scale is very useless, because... The, the freezing point of water is such a wacky number. It's 32 degrees Fahrenheit. The boiling point of water is a wacky number. It's 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see that because these numbers are so far apart that the, 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 um, the width of a degree, so to speak, in the Fahrenheit scale is much different than the width of a degree here. Here, the freezing point is zero. The boiling point is 100 makes total sense because we all know how water behaves. Here the freezing point is 32, the boiling point is 212. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So what you're going to find is that even though your air conditioner uh, is probably going to have Fahrenheit, even though the news uh, caster on TV is going to talk about Fahrenheit most of the time, you're not going to use Fahrenheit at all in this physics course. Except if a problem tries to give the temperature to you in that way to confuse you or to throw you off or to make you convert it, just to, just to show that you know how, you're generally not going to ever use Fahrenheit. You're going to use either Celsius or even more commonly Kelvin. When you start dealing with thermal energies and such, we're going to deal with Kelvin. So we'll be doing that a lot later. So let's go ahead and pause here, erase the board, and let's solve some problems on converting between the various temperature scales uh, and get some practice with that. Okay, now what we're going to do now is get some practice with converting among these different temperature scales that we've been talking about. So let's just jump right on in uh, to it. So the first problem uh, is going to basically say you have 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, what is that in degrees Celsius and also in Kelvin? So let's do the conversion to both of those things. And 98.6, if you don't already know, that's your body temperature. So we're going to go ahead and convert that to Celsius and Kelvin just to see what it is. Now, recall from the previous board that the Fahrenheit temperature is equal to 9 fifths times the Celsius temperature plus 32. So we're given the temperature in Fahrenheit, so we just put it right here. 98.6 is equal to 9 fifths. Uh, and actually, what I'm going to do at this point, if you take 9 fifths in your, in your calculator, you'll find out that that's 1.8 times Tc plus 32. Okay, so that's what we've done at this point. We've just plugged it in, and we've turned the fraction to a decimal. Subtract 32 from both sides. So what we're going to have on the left is 66.6 .6 is 1.8 times the Celsius temperature. Now, to, to solve for this temperature, we're going to divide both sides by 1.8. And so what we're going to get is the Celsius temperature is equal to 37 degrees Celsius. So your body temperature, when you don't have a fever, 98.6, okay, but it's 37 degrees Celsius. Okay, so 37 degrees is a, is a temperature you can relate to. That's your, your body temperature. All right, now how do we convert to Kelvin? The way we, we learned that just a few minutes ago was that the temperature in Kelvin was equal to the temperature in Celsius plus 273.15. Because I'm going to beat this into your head one way or another. The temperature in Kelvin is always going to be bigger. That's how you remember this formula. You start with Celsius and you add this. And the reason you can, you can remember if it's adding or subtracting is because Kelvin's always bigger. You have to add to the Celsius to get a bigger number. Okay, so what you're going to have is the Kelvin temperature is going to equal the Celsius temperature, 37 plus the 273.15. So the temperature in Kelvin, when you actually add these two things together, is 310.15 Kelvin.
Okay? So your body temperature, 98.6 Fahrenheit, 37 Celsius, 310.15 Kelvin. Now you would never use a Kelvin temperature to represent your body temperature. You would really have no need for it. Most of the time you're using Kelvin when you're dealing with energy levels and, and your physics equations that, that deal with the fundamental energy of nature. Either that or very, very uh, low temperatures close to absolute zero. Okay? High energy physics, thermal physics, when we're actually talking about the energy level of the atoms itself. And I'll make it clear to you as we go forward what scale you're going to use. But you're almost always going to use the Kelvin scale or the Celsius scale as we move forward. So let's go ahead and do another conversion. Let's say the temperature I have is negative 5 degrees Fahrenheit. And I want to convert that to Celsius and also to Kelvin. I want to convert to both. And so the way I do the conversion to Celsius, if you recall, the temperature, the Fahrenheit temperature is equal to 9 fifths the temperature of the Celsius here uh, plus 32. So I'm given the Fahrenheit temperature, okay, just like I was the last time. So it's negative 5, so you actually keep the negative sign just like you think you would. This is 1.8. The 9 fifths is roughly 1.8 if you put it in your calculator. Tc plus 32. So now if I take the 32 and subtract it from both sides, I'm going to get negative 37 over here. 1.8 times the temperature in Celsius. So to finally solve it, I divide by 1.8. So what I'll have is the 37 divided by 1.8 is going to be negative 20.6 degrees Celsius. Makes sense. This is a negative value, very cold, below zero, below freezing. So this is going to be below freezing as well. Okay? Just a different number. It represents exactly the same temperature. Now for Kelvin, remember, you're always going to take the Celsius number and add 273.15 because this, the Kelvin number is always going to be bigger than the Celsius number because the reference point's different. So what we're going to do is we're going to take what we started with, negative 20, 0.6 and we're going to add to it 273.15. So we're going to make it much, much bigger. And when we do that, we'll find that it's 252.6 Kelvin. 252.6 Kelvin. And it's still a big number, obviously, because the reference point, remember, for this, if this ever got to zero, the Kelvin number ever gets to zero, you have stopped all of your molecular motion. Obviously, negative five is, is a cold number. It's nowhere close to absolute zero. So this number is still a pretty hefty number in the Kelvin scale because it's nowhere close to absolute zero. Okay, the next problem is a little bit different. We're going to show that negative 40 degrees is the same in degrees Celsius and in degrees Fahrenheit. It just so happens there's one temperature that that's true because the temperature scales kind of cross and so the one temperature that that's true is negative 40. How would you prove that if they asked you that on a test? Well you know that the Fahrenheit is equal to 9 fifths uh, times the Celsius temperature plus 32. So what you're going to do is you're going to take this negative 40 and you're going to take it as a negative 40 degrees Celsius. You're going to put it in here and we're going to see what we calculate uh, for Fahrenheit. So we'll say Fahrenheit is equal to 9 fifths. The Celsius temperature is negative 40. Okay, just like that. Plus 32. We're just proving to ourselves that it's the same number in both temperature scales. So if I wanted to continue doing this, it would be 1.8, and that's what the 9 fifths is equal to. Negative 40 plus 32. And the 1.8 times the negative 40 is going to give you negative 72 plus 32. And then if I add these two together, you're going to get exactly what you expected to get, negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is a simple proof. I mean, basically, you're, you're, you're supposing the result is true, and you're just showing and proving to yourself that it is true. You take 40 Celsius, plug it through the equation there, and verify that it does, in fact, equal 40 uh, Fahrenheit. And that's just true because that's the point at which the temperature scales cross there. So it's, it's a common point to the temperature scales. So this section, we have dealt with temperature scales. We've covered a tremendous amount of ground temperature scales. Uh, Celsius, Fahrenheit, Kelvin. We've talked about how to make a thermometer, what temperature is. We've also talked about the zeroth law of thermodynamics, which basically allows a thermometer to exist and sort of tells you that you can go around measuring things with a thermometer. And 
that it's a useful instrument. That's basically what the zeroth uh, law actually means. So we've done that. So mainly what I want you to pull out of this is that you can convert these temperature scales and the conversions are super simple. So just try to memorize those. You'll use them a lot as you go on throughout the course. The sections to come, we're going to start talking more and more about heat transfer and uh, how to calculate uh, if something shrinks or expands whenever you give it some, some extra heat. We're going to talk about engines. We're really getting into the heart of thermodynamics and then we're going to go on beyond that. So I hope you enjoyed the first section. Stay tuned and we'll continue on and pick up with the rest of thermodynamics.